The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, thank you. Well, just to begin with, I want to thank everybody for coming to this talk. Um, this is my first time to Charlotte, and uh, so far, loving it. Um, I'm here with Percona, um, and I'm going to be presenting a, a slightly different talk than what's in the program. Originally, what we had scheduled was a talk by Ryan Lowe based on using dot files. And I apologize, uh, Ryan's not able to make it, so I had to pull in a, at the last minute one of my own slide decks that, um, that, I, that I've delivered before, so I hope it works for you. Today we're going to be talking about um, implementing Percona monitoring plugins for Na Nagios and Cacti. Uh, it does say Percona monitoring plugins. Um, these are open source GPL based templates. So it's more of a talk about how Nagios and Cacti are used with regards to OS level and database monitoring. So if that's your kind of flavor, you want to talk about or hear some stuff about that and have some questions for me, um, by all means stick around. Okay. So. Um, who am I? Uh, I'm a Canadian. I moved down to the U.S. This is my second time working in the U.S., but um, I moved down in 2011 to live in North Carolina. I live in the Raleigh area. And in the spring of last year, I joined Percona as a consultant. Um, most of our work is done remotely, which I love. Uh, I get to stay home in all the beautiful weather that we get here in the state. So uh, very comfortable. I've got my family, my kids. Uh, the school is not too far away. So. Um, we love it, we love it. Uh, prior to that, I worked for a number of different stock photography companies uh, as a system administrator. And so my background is more on the system side than development. Um, so I'm quite intimately familiar with uh, monitoring and alerting and what it's like to get those pages at eight, two in the morning and what do you do about it. So um, since then, I was working for an email service provider where I was a database administrator. Uh, then I became lead to the team. So um, I've got skills, I think, on both sides of the Linux and also the, 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 the MySQL side. Um, and I also want to give credit for the original slide deck that's being delivered here. These were developed by Baron Schwartz, who uh, had worked with Percona for a number of years. And um, so thank you, Baron, if you're watching. Okay, so what we're going to go through is a bunch of different uh, angles of looking at monitoring and alerting. We're going to try and define it. We want to talk about what it's like to look at a historical view of, of a problem state. Um, we're going to look at what it means to do fault detection. And that's more uh, what is happening right here and now. What is broken at this moment? I don't care so much about what it looked like a week ago. That's a different tool's responsibility. But Nagios is going to tell us what, what's going on, what's out of range, what threshold has been crossed. We'll talk a little bit about what to monitor. This is going to come a little bit more of a deeper focus into MySQL. So um, I guess this is probably a good time to ask, where is the background with, with people in the audience? Are, are there many MySQL users here right now? Let me just show of hands. Okay, we got one, okay. Um, okay, um, do you use other types of data stores? Uh, NoSQLs or Postgres or some other RDBMS? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Okay, um, we'll talk about a little bit of the tools that are actually involved in here, the Cacti and the Nagios components. And we'll talk about what the Percona monitoring plugins deliver beyond the vanilla installations of those two pieces of software of Cacti and Nagios. OK, so two big things going on. Now, in, in the sphere of software that's out there today, there are tools that do both of these, and they do them well. Um, generally, though, that comes with a price tag. And in the spirit of the self-conference, I'm focusing on open source-based ones that you can download and use for free. You can get support contracts on these kinds of things. Percona would love to help you with that. But by and large, you can install these things, Cacti and Nagios specifically, run them all day long. Big shops, small shops, they do it. And they, they don't have to sign up for, for expensive contracts. So um, I won't go into, it, into too much detail talking about those other products out there. Um, where, where are these two come apart? Cacti is designed to look at the long-term historical view of what's been happening with my system. And Cacti is able to monitor things such as your database server, what's happening in MySQL. It can look at your OS level and say, these are the, the throughput statistics of my disk. Here's the latency of my disk. Um, here's the CPU percentage of you, uh, CPU use. These kinds of metrics are all plotted in Cacti. And it uses a backend called RRD, which stands for Round Robin Database. 
and it plots these things over a time period. The file size never changes, but what it does is it discards data as the time gets older. So where you might have good resolution in the short term, over the last week or so, you can view things at a five minute interval. Maybe over, if you look back a year ago though, you only see resolution down to every 30 minutes or maybe every two hours. So the data gets discarded the older it is. With the, the concept is that you probably don't care about what it looked like on Monday of January of 2012, but you do care about what it looked like last Monday. Okay. Um, and then on the other side, Cacti is great at looking at things in, in the historical view and it just plots stuff. You don't generally get an email alert or anything from it. The other side is the Nagios that tells me, all right, I, there's a fault condition somewhere in my application stack. Is it my web server has too many connections on it? Is it my database has too many connections on it? Now I can't log in, the website is down. All these kinds of things are the responsibility of Nagios to identify those and then send out some sort of a, of a metric to the, to the system administrator, to the NOC, whoever is responsible for fixing the problem that comes up with your website or your application. Um, Nagios is great in that it's, uh, it's, it, it's able to send out emails, SMSs, a whole bunch of different ways that you can get paged and woken up in the middle of the night. Okay. Now, when we're doing metrics, we really want to look for what's, what's important happening in your data. In, I, won't, I, won't I won't keep saying database. What's happening in your system. Um, Cacti can be extended beyond the templates I'm going to show. Uh, for example, when I was working at some of these stock photography sites, we wanted to keep track of how many uh, image processing jobs were waiting to be processed and what state they were in. Well, it was fairly trivial for me to query a database, find out what the pending jobs were, and then plot them in, in Cacti. Now, a view like that helps not only me, but it helps the business decide and helps me justify to the business when we need to add new hardware. I can show these graphs that show on the weekend we get these influxes of images and it doesn't ever degrade. We're getting to a point where we're not getting through all of our jobs in the weekend anymore. It's that kind of a conversation coupled with a, with a graphing tool that plots values that says to your boss, all right, the time is here. We need to, we need to invest in our hardware. We need to go buy, spin up some more AWS instances or something to that effect. Okay. So the point is though with, with capturing metrics, you want to look for what's useful to your business. It's fine and dandy to go and capture stuff happening um, in Mongo, but if you're not actually using Mongo in your deployment or in production, it's probably not a graph you're going to look at all that often. So just keep in mind that you want to be capturing useful data right now. Okay. Um, Cacti is great for generating graphs that you can zoom in on. It will generate default views at the, at the daily, the weekly, and the monthly views but you can zoom in and uh, view some finer granularity of it. So it's great for when you want to do some more in-depth analysis of what actually happened at 8, 10 uh, yesterday morning. You can get that kind of detail out of it, okay? Um, but on the flip side where I was saying, you know, don't graph everything. Well, sometimes you, you want to begin by graphing everything. Just take this with a grain of salt because unless you know what you're exactly looking for when your website is down, then you often are just kind of scratching around going, well, what was the problem last time? And maybe it's a different problem today. So sometimes when you go to your graphs and you've been plotting these three or four different data points, you didn't even know why or what they even mean, but you see them skewing differently, that's often a, uh, oh my gosh, here it is. Here's where I gotta go with this. Here's a way I can focus my attention and figure out what's actually going wrong in my system, okay? So the, the corollary is sometimes you do wanna graph more than you actually think you need to know, okay? Um, can you monitor everything? Yeah, probably if your installation is small enough, but uh, depending on the size of your shop, if it's only a couple servers, sure, a single instance of Cacti could plot that all day long. If you're, if you're starting to get into an environment where you might have 500 or 1,000 different servers and systems, that's gonna be a lot of load on that box, so perhaps you're not gonna be able to monitor all those different facets. But hopefully by that point that you're monitoring that many boxes, you've got a system administration and development team that can support you and help you focus your attention as well, okay? Okay. So fault detection, this is the flip side. We talked about this a little bit. It's, this is what Nagios' responsibility is. It wants to tell you what's happening right here and now. It has very little, if any, uh, information about what happened last week. It will keep track of, did I alert you last week at eight o'clock in the morning? It will have that data. It might even store the threshold value that it actually crossed or what the, so for example, let's take something easy. You want to keep track of the CPU time on your web server and you know when it gets above 50%, the website performance just stinks and that you need to get out of bed and you need to fire up another AWS instance, okay? So if that alert goes off in the middle of the night and it says it's at 60%, you get out of bed and you do your job. Now, that's what Nagios is all, all it's gonna do is ping you and say, hey look, I just did a health check, it was over 50%, get up, do something. And as you fix the condition, as you add that other web server and then the first server's CPU comes down below 
the, the next check that Nagios will do will say, oh, look, it's only at 40%. It will clear the alert. Now, in terms of logging, you have that email that just got sent to you, probably that SMS that got sent to your phone that woke you up. And you've got a view in Nagios through the, the, the GUI to say, last week at 8 in the morning, I got an alert from it. But that's really the extent of it. So don't count on Nagios to do any type of long-term profiling of how your system has been healthy. Um, it will show you when you got pinged about something, but it doesn't really give you any context around it. Okay. Um, some other things, and I'll, I'll jump through these real, real quick here. What happens is that people, and this is probably human nature, they, they set up these alerts and they think, oh, I'm going to do something when I get this, this message sent to me. Um, but they soon find out that it's not an actionable message. If you can't just make the CPU usage go away, if your only option is I have to live with my one server and just let the web traffic kind of dissipate so CPU comes back down, you probably don't want to get woken up for that. You only want to get woken up if you have an actionable item going on. Because if you get woken up at 2 in the morning and you stare at your screen and say, whoops, what can I do? You should have just stayed in bed. Okay? So what ends up happening? You probably have a lot of spammy alerts, alerts that, that come in and you can't do anything on or you just say, oh, that's insignificant. You end up creating email filters. You send them to DevNull. It, it, it's just human nature. You don't want to get all these interruptions. Um, the, the danger to that is you start perhaps missing important conditions out there. You might miss some, some relationship of, oh, this alert comes in when this alert happens, and that might have helped you focus and fix the problem sooner. So that's the danger of having too many spammy alerts coming in. Okay? Um, so when, when we talked about cacti and monitoring in terms of graphing, it's, it's okay to graph a lot more than you actually need. But in terms of alerting through Nagios, be careful with that, because the more false alerts you get, the more false positives you receive, the less likely it is you're actually going to look at your phone next time it pings at you. So careful with that. OK, so why, why, why am I even talking about Perconer monitoring plugins? Um, I'll introduce that really quickly, and then I'll get to, to what the point of uh, the rest of the slide is. Um, the monitoring plugins, these are uh, templates that we've got. They're all either written in Bash in terms of the Nagios scripts. Um, and for Cacti, these are templates that we've designed for Cacti. They're, they're XML based. You just have to import these things and make them work for your environment. There's no cost to acquiring these things. Um, you could do them yourself. But that leads right to the first point. It's tricky to get these things right. Okay? Um, if you're working with templates, working with cacti, you can usually design one-offs fairly well. But the advantage of the Percona monitoring ones is that we take all the different data points that you get out of show global status and correlate that into useful graphs. So we take, you know, depending on which version of MySQL you're running, some of them have over 300 different status counters. When you boil that down, do you want to look at 300 different graphs? What Percona has done is we've taken that and condensed that into 42 graphs. So some graphs might only have one data point being plotted, like replication lag, but other ones might have about six or eight different data points, like where, where are the, the stalls in InnoDB happening? Are they happening on pending reads, pending writes? We tie all that together, we put some pretty colors on it and make it useful for you so you can get up and working right away. Okay? Um, in terms of the, the, the so that, that part's fairly easy. You could go and implement that yourself. That, the cacti stuff wouldn't be as hard. Where I think it really starts to shine is for the Nagios plugins, where we've done the, the shell scripting for you, and we've got the error condition handling, and we fix this stuff because we use it with our own customers. So where I, ha I implement it for a customer of mine, and I stay working with them for a number of months, if I start to see bugs with it, I just need to report it to my internal dev team. They fix it, and for free, as users of this stuff, you get it in the next release. We just bake it in and we make it available to everybody else. So basically my time has been consumed through this customer's paying for my time to fix this software. So you would make a, it would make a, it's a pretty easy sell, I think, for you to, to take advantage of this kind of stuff out there. And we're, I guess we're not the only company doing this kind of a play, but um, Nagios and Cacti, the templates that we've got, they're great. There's other ones out there, though, too. Um, ours are a little more battle tested, in my opinion. So take that for what it's worth. OK. Um, so the way Nagios works, just a quick background on it, it works based on plugins. There is a core Nagios daemon that runs, and its job is to spawn off health checks. And it can, it can parallelize these to a certain degree, depending on how you have your environment set up. But generally, with a simple shop, you'll have one Nagios installation, so one Nagios D running. And what it does is it can call out to various types of shell scripts. It could be uh, in Bash, it could be in Perl, whatever language you like. It has all the libraries supported on that server that it's running from. Um, and also, it's got some that are written in C for some super fast ones that need to run. So the point of it is, though, is it, it acts just on the exit code of that script. So where you might have one that does some complicated measuring of logging into a database and checking accounts in a table based on some where clause, all, you, all Nagios cares about is what is the exit code of that. 
If it comes back as a zero, it's going to say, that health check was healthy. That's great. If it comes back with a one, two, or three, those represent warning, uh, critical, and unknown states. And that will actually generate some sort of an action within NongEOSD. Okay, so it all worked on the concept of standard out. Uh, sorry, of, of the exit code. And then it lets you print a little message as well uh, to standard out, which would be included when you use the Nagios GUI. Okay. Um, a lot of Nagios plugins written for Nagios can be used elsewhere because they are simply shell scripts. So things like Zabbix or Xenos or these other ones, they can all leverage these types of scripts as well. Okay. When we're doing monitoring and alerting, uh, there's certain things at Nagios that, that I particularly like working with. And uh, this is more of the MySQL focus right here. Um, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, when you work with MySQL, replication is probably one of its biggest charms or benefits, I'd say. So when you have a slave of a master, you can offload a lot of your reads onto the slave and still send your writes to the master. Well, one of the drawbacks to MySQL is that there's no consistency guarantee that says that slave will always have the same records as the master. There is the potential for drift. So that slave at some point through multiple different types of conditions could end up having different row counts in a certain table or actually different data for the same row counts. So that could be problematic for your app. If you write something in the master, you know, ID equals one and a whole bunch of values to go with it, you expect to see that when you go to read it back off the slave. If it's different, that's going to render the UI broken or you know, your app will be basically uh, un unusable. So why does that matter? Well, there's a, there's a suite of tools out there from Percona called Percona Toolkit. And um, there's two components to that. Well, there's about 30 tools in there, but the, the one we referenced right off the top, there's a tool called PT Table Checksum. And what it does is it uses le replication to group the chunks of rows on the master and the slave, and it does a comparison. So it does a checksum across a group of rows, and at the end of it all, it will show you which rows, which chunks are different from your master to your slave. So that gives you a heads up to say, aha, somewhere, I don't know how it happened, but my slave has different data. Great. This tool can run. You usually run it from cron. And then you'll set up Nagios to actually log in and check this table to, for, the, for the status results to say, have you seen any problems? And if you see any problems, please send me an alert. Okay? That's where Nagios, I love it. The, 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 the typical way that checksums gets deployed with a customer is they just have it set up for a cron with an email alert coming to them. Well, people get these emails, and they check it pretty good for a week or two weeks, but they stop looking in it. Well, if they don't look in it, and there's data drift happening, they're not seeing the fact that there's an email that says, you got a problem with your slave. And only until they get a report from their business unit or somebody saying there's problems with the website, do they maybe go back and do it. Well, that's why I love this. Let Nagios log in and tell you when there's a checksum problem. Um, the Nagios checks can also come in and tell you about replication. Is the replication thread stopped? Generally, that's, your, that's gonna be your first alert. Your, your other alert's gonna be your business you call, calling you in about eight hours saying, you know, I added credits to this person's accounts and they're still telling me that they don't have any credits in there. What's going on? And then you check your slave and you go, oh, replication's been down for eight hours. So you've been serving up stale data. So better to let Nagios tell you that you had a problem before your business unit tells you. Um, it can t it, and there's other checks in there. Some that check, you know, how many threads are running at any current time, um, what state they're in. It can check the process table within MySQL, things like that. Um, what's happening with NODB? Do we have any extra long uh, queries that are running? Do we have a lot of tables that are being held for locks? These kinds of things can all be alerted. And finally, I'll leave you with, you can have status counters of any type be reported on. Generally, I don't usually recommend you just pick them, but if you have a specific condition where your website starts to crash when you get, um, I don't know, uh, max or you're reaching max connections, um, and you simply just start to hit some sort of threshold level in the database, that's something you want to act on. That's unique to your environment. So set up a specific alert using our toolkit to, to wake yourself up and do something about it. Okay, so what exactly do you want to monitor? Well, the Nagios toolkit has some, some basic stuff. It's going to check for threads running and alert when it gets above 20 as a warning and above 40 as critical. That may or may not be important to you. You might have a 60 core machine or something and think, well, I don't care. I could probably do 100 threads running and that's no problem for my server. Well, then you're going to want to fix that. But that's the default setting for that alert is at 20 and 40 for threads running. Um, I, another one, though, that I really like is that you want to be alerted when threads connect is approaching max connections. That is an error condition that probably something has gone awry, uh, awry in your database. And you want to know that hey, I got 2,000 as my max connections, and I usually run around 100, but somehow we're up around 1,500. The web servers are going crazy. Some bad code got pushed, whatever. That's an error condition I would want to know about and I could do something about. Okay? So when threads, are, threads connected to the server are approaching how many they're actually allowed to actually store, uh, service, you want to know about that. Um, another one is, this is a simple one. Did my, is the uptime fairly low? 
And that should not usually be the case unless you had a planned restart. And now MySQL's got this wrapper, MySQL D safe, and it's great at, at monitoring whether MySQL D is up and also great at starting it up again. Well, I've worked with a number of customers that weren't aware that their database was crashing and restarting on them, and it might happen multiple times a day. They'd get these weird stalls in their app, and they didn't really know what was going on, but they went on with it until finally they said, okay, we gotta get, we gotta get this thing resolved. Well, we get in there and we see that this thing is restarting over and over. If I had an alert on there, uptime getting close to zero again, that would have tipped us off right off the bat. So that's the kind of thing that I leave behind when I leave a customer site. You have Nagios, great, I'll get these things installed for you. Okay. Okay, um, this, is, this is a little more, uh, I, I guess it's, there, there are lots of different opinions on this one. Um, I generally am not, not a big favor of uh, ratios in the database. They don't often tell you a great deal of information. Um, like if you start looking at things like, what is my cache miss ratio? Well, I don't know. It depends on the size of the query. It depends on you know, how many other queries I actually you know, did service from the cache and, and how much of my memory I'm putting aside for this. Could I be doing my caching at a different layer outside the database, maybe in memcache or Redis or something else? I'm, I'm not really a big fan. I don't get a lot out of what the, the ratios are, um, but that's up to you guys if you want to use it. Um, another one is, is you know, how quickly is a particular variable changing per second? It, it, well, you know, if you, if you have a perfectly flat workload where it's utterly predictable, that is maybe a use case where you could say, okay, when you know, uh, inserts com select or com insert goes over 1,000 and I'm usually at 500, okay, that's cool. But if you're running a typical application, you've got high points and low points of the day. You've got users who are logging in in the morning and who are maybe doing stuff late at night or maybe you're a late at night kind of app for a dating site or something. Well, what, what's normal then? You, know? you probably don't just have a magic number that when things go above it, send me an alert, okay? Um, and that's really what threshold base and variable per second kind of alerts are. Some metric is being, my, my variable is saying I'm doing 200 of some operation right now. Is that good or bad? And that's leaving it up to you as a threshold to say, I don't really know if that's good or bad. Sometimes it's good. In the daytime, that's great. At nighttime, it might not be good. So I'm leaving it kind of in a, in a vague way here, but um, just be cautious when you see some recommendations on the net about whether you should be using ratios and threshold based alerts for Nagios. Your mileage may vary on it. Okay, so finding a single right threshold can be pretty darn tricky too, um, for a lot of the reasons we already talked about. The, the server is gonna have different performance characteristics throughout the week, weekday through versus a weekend, uh, morning versus night. Okay, those are considerations you probably need to bake into your application. Um, the, the other thing that, that freaks me out the most about it is that you want these alerts to be actionable. You wanna have a, wake me up out of bed, yes, because I have a problem, but I also need to be able to do something about it. Frankly, if the website is down and there's nothing I can do about it until the web traffic clears, until people just go away and then they come back later, you know what, it sucks, but don't wake up, because what do you do? And you're just gonna stare at your screen and send emails to your boss saying, you know, I looked at it and there's nothing I can do. So that's probably an extreme case, but the point is, is that you want actionable results coming out of this. So these threshold base, these variable per second, they don't often give you a lot of meat to work on. Okay, um, this I think is the last slide on, on Nagios. Um, we, we have one particular one here that lets you change uh, based on the kind of query you want to run. So, for example, when I was working at the stock places, we wanted to say, if our worker queue in the database had more than 200 items, that's a problem. That means probably our worker jobs broke for some reason. So that means get up somebody, look in and figure out what's wrong with Gearman. Okay, well, I generate an alert at 200 items. I just count from the table and if it's over 200, get out of bed. This is the kind of tool that we'd use, PMP check MySQL status, that lets you formulate a specific query that you can run in the database and then return your exit code as appropriate. To, to generate an action in Nagios. So there's, that's the tool if you have specific things for your app in the database you want to query, that's the tool to use. Okay, and this is what it looks like. For those of you who haven't used Nagios before, um, I wouldn't say the GUI is like all web 2.0, but I, it works well enough, I think, for, for what it's got to do. Um, this is a dump from one of my customer screens. I blacked out the, the name of the company down there at the bottom, but um, they, they run a pretty high profile um, uh, uh, image, sorry, not image, uh, video sharing site. So they've got some pretty high-end equipment. You notice that they've got some Virident cards in there. So they've got specific checks for that. Um, and while I was with them, I implemented some of the PMP-specific ones. And I'm still working with them today. So this is one of the things that I get on my phone, too, to tell me I've got a problem with this, to help out this customer. So in the case we were talking about the table checksums, that's exactly what it's gonna look like. You see the yellow line there that shows that we had an error condition arise. We've got 97 different chunks based on three tables. So that means there's different data on this slave. And this is the check you'd run against all your slaves in your production environment to let you know when there's data drift. 
Now, the interesting thing I've noticed is I've used this with more and more customers. That data drift isn't always going to be uh, happening across all of your slaves. So I used to just assume that if I saw it on one, I'd see the problem condition everywhere, and then one fix would fix it all. That's not, that's not often been the case. So what, in, what, it, what I mean by all this is that you want to run these checks on all of your servers, all of your slaves. Don't just pick a slave and try to fix it there. Run it on all of the slaves. OK. Um, so, but in other, other case, green is good. We're not getting any emails at that point. Okay, and then when I talked about just the different types of uh, standard output information that you see, that's where this disk OK, free space, uh, TCP OK, all these other components come out after the exit code is handled by, by Nagios. Okay, so Cacti, Cacti is beautiful for being able to go back in time, see what was happening. Where I love to use this is where I'll be helping out a customer and, and it's a 911 condition where they've called us and they're willing to pay premium dollars to solve a problem really quickly. Well, that's high stress for them, but also high stress for the consultants who are trying to help them you know, under the gun. I don't have to know anything about this customer yet, other than their name. I might have heard them in the news. That's about it. I get on their system, and they tell me they've got cacti, and they're using their monitoring plugins, or any, any plugins. I don't really care at that point. Where it's beautiful is I can take a view of what it's doing today on, uh, 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 on today versus seven days ago, and I stand those graphs side by side, and I go down, and we're looking right off the bat what's different. That, is the, that to me, is the beauty of where cacti shines. Yeah, you might look at cacti when things are, aren't busy, but generally you're looking at them when things are a panic. You, you may or may not know where to look. So if you don't know where to look, stack the graphs side by side, looking at a week ago, a month ago, whatever. Is this regular behavior for this time period in, you know, was this expected last week? That's where it comes in. Okay. Okay. So we're, we're, we're getting towards the end. Um, I've got some slides, to, that, a number more of slides, but we're going to go really quickly through them. So this is the last of more of the talking slides. Um, Cacti is, is based on a, a number of different components. Um, Cacti has a collection module. It's called the Polar. And it's, I think it's at polar.php. And if you're in a larger environment, you might be using a C-based one, which is called Spline. Okay? And the point of that is, is, as you start to collect more servers, you want to get the collections of all this data done within a fixed interval. If you're doing it by default, every five minutes, this polar is going to go out and ask for more data from the servers and then do its thing. It's going to plot them in these RRD files. Well, if you start running over that five minute interval, you're going to have things stepping on each other, and that's not good. So at some point, the developer said, you know, this PHP single threaded operation isn't going to work for us. And then they implemented some measure of threading in it, but it only got them so far. Then they moved to Spline, where they could do a whole bunch of uh, parallel jobs. Okay, just some background on what Cacti is doing. So collections going on. It's through a bunch of uh, scripts. In our case, we wrote ours in PHP. Um, if we had had to do it again, it would probably be in a different language, but whatever, it's what we have today. And the job of the polar is to collect the data and then write it into these RRD files. Once they're written to the RRD file, the polar goes away. It's done. And then it wakes up again on cron and, and does its job. Where the cacti that we're most useful, uh, used to is the actual GUI interface, which is delivered through PHP um, to your browser. And it, it's what actually drops down into the, the RRD files and draws those on demand, those graphs for you, and lets you zoom in on them. And, and that kind of thing, okay? So when you're setting up this environment, you need to import the scripts. You need to get this, the, so import the, the template scripts. You then need to get the shell, uh, the, sorry, the PHP script onto the file system so it can do its thing by connecting to the database servers and pulling in the data. You need to then create graphs within Cacti. So tell it what the host names are and all the different username passwords it needs to know about. And then you need to just generate a graph tree. This is kind of a trivial last step, but you, need, you probably want to organize it to say, you know, this is my Las Vegas data center data, uh, databases, and here's my, you know, my New York City databases. And you might put them in a different view because you have different sysadmin teams monitoring them, something like that. Okay? But basically, four steps. It, it, if I get on with a customer and everything is set up, if they already got cacti running, we could probably knock this thing out in an hour or so. So it's, it's the kind of thing where the investment is fairly cheap for you to get going, and it pays off in dividends, huge dividends later on. OK, so where do you get it? Get off of Percona.com. We have a download section. This is a little bit out of date. I think we've got up to 1.03 is out there now. We've also got some, um, some RPM and dev-based packages for, uh, I th think, for the Nagios plugins. So we've, we're starting to make it a, that much easier. Instead of just undoing tar or unpacking tarballs, we can actually have them built within your package manager, too. OK, um, once Cacti is set up, this is a, a brand new installation. So the password is admin and admin is the, is, are the, the credentials. That's what it looks like. Um, you want to just basically hop in there and then have at setting up the uh, importing the templates. On the left-hand side is where all of the administration work under the console tab. 
you choose import templates and it's going to pop you to another screen that allows you to hit a drop box. And in here, you're going to have locally these Perconer monitoring plugins. In one of the directories, you'll see all the different scripts that you can actually import, the different templates. Now, the one I'm focusing on for this slide deck is for the MySQL server, but we've got them out there for Apache, um, for the Linux server, which are a little bit better than the ones that are baked into the, uh, the Cacti default install. I think it's just got more monitoring points. Um, uh, OpenVZ, I've never really used that one too much. Um, Nginx and Redis. So have at it. They're, they're great graphs. Oh, there's a Memcache one in there too, and Mongo. So they, we monitor a lot more stuff with Perconer monitoring plugins than just, with my, than just MySQL. Um, then you choose, you've, you've selected it, you tell it to import. It spins for a few, few seconds, and then what you're looking for is everything to be green, green successes, and usually it should be. Once the templates are imported, that's, that's imported a number of different components. It's got the graph, the host, and the data templates, and that allows Cacti to understand how do I go and collect data from somewhere, where do I save it, and then how do I relate it onto a graph? What data points do I pull in and munge into one graph? That's what the, the point of these three different templates are on the left. So the next major step is to set up a device. You want to go in and you want to, by default, you're going to have the local host monitored. monitored. You might be running Cacti on the same box as your, as your web server or your database, that's fine. But generally, you've got a separate box set aside for monitoring. So you'll want to go in and you'll define um, add at the top right. In this case, I've just done it all on one server. So that's why it's going to go a little bit differently. But generally, you're going to go through the add at the top right. You're going to see new options available in the dropdown. Now, out of the box, Cacti has got a number of different monitoring points. Um, the Percona MySQL one is the one we just added. If you were going to do Mongo or Memcache, you'd see an additional option in there to select. Okay? And the advantage of that, instead of trying to do it yourself, you can add the graphs one at a time and data sources one at a time. But because you imported all those templates in, you can just select it once, and it will do all of the, the relation stuff for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is on the actual, you have to drop to the command line just for a couple steps. Because we have this, uh, this PHP script that does the collection from the database servers, you need to put it into the scripts directory where Cacti expects to see all of its scripts. Make sure um, that it's readable by the Cacti user, whoever it's running as. And then you need to define the credentials for it. This is the simplest way to do it and the way that most of my customers do it. They've got the same username and password on all of their database servers for the Cacti user to run. So just with the minimal privileges that Cacti needs to, to get its data. Now I think that involves super, so it's kind of a lot of privileges, but lock it down based on the IP address of the monitoring server. That's what we end up doing. So that's all you need to do. You edit the script, where you put it in place, and then you edit it to put the right username and password in, and then you're done at the command line. Then once you've got the server defined, you want to tell it that now we're ready to create some graphs for it. Okay. It will pop you to a screen that has all the different graphs available. This goes down for about 42 uh, different line items. Choose the one at the top because you probably want to make all the graphs. Okay, and then at the bottom of that screen, there's a you know click next to continue kind of thing. It will take you to the screen saying I've created all the graphs. Then you want to put it on a tree, like you were talking about. You might have different data centers. You might just have different ways that you want to show. Um, you can show graph trees that show not only host to host mappings, but you can take out specific graphs within Cacti and say. I want to show all of the InnerDB statistics for all my servers on one set of graph trees. So that's what you're able to do in this view here. Okay, and then what ends up happening is when when the graphing is, is uh, has, has when the collection has begun, it usually takes two monitoring periods for graphs to display. So you're going to be in this bit of a split. You're going to have one state where your graphs are starting to show up, but they might have NaN. There isn't any data been stored into them yet. But after two polling intervals, the graph will display, and there'll be some values being populated in there. Give it some time, usually a few hours, and you'll actually have something interesting to look back and see some curves and some ups and downs going on with your graphs. OK, so just to kind of wrap up on, on what, what I hope you can take away from this talk, um, you want to be, be fairly aggressive of what you're collecting with regards to cacti. Um, it's your good long term. I don't know what's wrong. I want to look and see what's out of the norm. Um, but be careful about Nagios. Be careful about what you're going to alert on. It's OK to put a check in Nagios. Maybe you don't want to set it, though, to page you between certain hours at night. Be more cautious around that. Okay? Um, don't, don't try to write everything yourself. I mean, you don't have to use Percona monitoring plugins. We're not, we don't, there's no value truly to Percona in terms of um, you know, monetary reward. There's maybe some community goodwill. Uh, we want to be able to give back as, 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 a, as, a, as an enterprise. Um, so please take advantage of the work that our development team is continually supporting the software. You know, we're, in, we're in no place to abandon it. 
But having said that, there are lots of other checks out there. Feel free, lots of other graphs that you can pull in with, with Nagios, and uh, sorry, with Cacti. So have at that too. Um, and, and you know, some of the systems that I talked about earlier, like the Xenos, it does everything all in one. Hey, that works for some customers. They don't want to monkey around with different types of environments. But in my experience, if you're going to stay open source, probably the two best are going to be the Cacti and the Nagios for monitoring and for alerting. So I think you end up having to, to go that route for a while until we see maybe a, a different tool bubble up. Okay. Um, Again, the, that first link is more database specific, but I, I really would encourage you to take a look at that one. There's a lot of good stuff in there for a system administrator to say, you know what, I never thought to monitor for that, or I never thought that kind of error condition come up, could come up. So it's, it's definitely worth the read. It's only a couple pages long. And we've got some blog posts that just discuss differences um, between our product and, and some of the other checks that are out there, why it might be easier to use ours. So I think, I think this is my last one. And that's it. That's it. Does anybody have any questions or any, anything we wanted to talk about? We have a fairly small group, so keep it informal. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Can I ask, does, does anybody, um, I probably should have asked this up front, is anybody doing any monitoring and alerting right now? We've got a couple of customers, some are using Agios, a couple of them are using OpenNMS. Okay. Um, and I've used both. Okay. Do you, do you have a preference? Kind of like the discovery that OpenNMS gives me. Um, I like the flexibility that I can get. Easy flexibility with Nagios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I've heard it said that the Nagios config files can be pretty hairy. If, if you let them get away from you, they can. Yeah. 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 It's the kind of thing you want to have under version control and be, uh, be checking in quite often. Or multiple, or multiple administrators that don't agree on how to do stuff. Exactly right. That's right. Um, I'm not familiar too much with OpenMS. Does it do uh, the, the, the graphing side as well, the historical view? It does the um, alerting, trending, and uh, um, discovery. It uses SNMP on the back end to query whatever you want to query. Mm -hmm. <coughs> you can either write an SNMP plugin or you can write an agent plugin to get the data you need. I, I'm going to have to take a look at that. Okay. Um, are there any anybody else want to raise any concerns or any questions? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. I hope you enjoyed it. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication from Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, a thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. 
it is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail. And CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale, number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint, it's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack, they were using it to transcode video, and I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, and then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. 
We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astro or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astro. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.